Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in different parts of the world. I appreciate everyone uh, coming on to today's webcast, which is Wellness and Medical Travel, Understanding the Market Opportunity. Um, excited to have participation from all five continents, people from all around the globe for today's webcast. Um, I think it should be a really uh, great, great topic. Um, I, I think everyone should really enjoy it. It's going to be filled with a lot of statistics and information on what's going on in wellness um, tourism and what's going on in medical travel and how this plays out for the hospitality and hotel and travel industry. Today's webcast is uh, brought to you by the International Luxury Hotel Association in partnership with the Medical Tourism Association. I'm Jonathan Edelheit, uh, CEO of the Medical Tourism Association, and we're going to really cover a little bit about understanding the market opportunity. Um, I'll first uh, run, run through a couple slides about ILHA. Uh, Barack Hershowitz, uh, the president of the International Luxury Hotel Association, um, you know, is going to be providing the introduction to today's uh, webcast, uh, but unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. So I'll kind of run through a little bit about ILHA, a little bit about the MCA. Then we're going to go into the history of wellness and medical travel, the role of the hospitality and the travel industry in wellness and medical travel, um, the importance of oh, getting certified in wellness or medical travel and the importance of the consumer experience. Um, so who is OHA? Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of OHA, but for those of you who aren't, the International Luxury Hotel Association is a membership-based global nonprofit association for the luxury, hospitality, and travel industry. And it's the only organization of its kind out there. Um, ILHA uh, really brings together industry professionals with the common goal of improving standards, promoting innovation in service and design, and a core focus of professional development. Um, so Barack Hershowitz, who is the president of ILHA, um, you know, the foundation of the association has been around for years. So he has basically, um, you know, run the, the largest LinkedIn group in the world on luxury hotels. Um, it's got, I think, now over 178,000 followers. It's ranked number one out of 4,000 hotel and travel groups on LinkedIn. And they get about 1,000 new members each week. Um, and, you know, he surveyed the group after running the group and managing conversation and collaboration within the industry. And the biggest feedback last year from members of the group was they wanted to see a trade association established to really help provide professional development and advancement of um, people within the international luxury ho hotel and hospitality space. So the uh, Ale Hall was founded. Um, you know, and uh, you know, it launched about a month ago, and it's been up and running, and new members are joining. So we encourage uh, everyone to really join the association and to learn about the benefits in the membership. Um, it's on the website, luxuryhotelassociation.org, and you can kind of join today. Um, there's also the Luxury Hotels newsletter, which is Smart Brief, which is a daily newsletter that goes out to over, I believe, 12,000 people every day uh, in the luxury hotel space. So please uh, feel free to subscribe to that newsletter. It's free. Um, and that is also a benefit of ILFA. And definitely join the LinkedIn group if you're not a member. It's a great tool. Um, there's going to be a lot of education ILFA is going to do this year, from educational webcasts on the latest trends, hot topics in the luxury hotel space, um, and there's going to be a lot of education. And then the uh, International Luxury Hotel Association also has Luxury Hoteliers Magazine, um, which is a digital monthly magazine really talking about the cutting trends and really what's going on in the luxury hotel space. Um, that website is luxuryhoteliers.com, and I encourage you all to check it out. And if you have a great topic or a trending topic, to uh, please feel free to submit a call uh, for an article for submitting one to the magazine. Um, the International Luxury Hotel Association is going to have its annual conference, its first annual conference, um, this September 20th through 24th in Washington, D.C., and it's going to be integrated within the um, World Medical Tourism and Global Healthcare Congress, co-located there with it. Um, so look out for some more information on the agenda, speakers, um, and opportunities to participate in the conference. It's going to be really, uh, you know, the cutting edge and the leading uh, event in the luxury hotel space. So to talk to you a little bit about the Medical Tourism Association, um, to uh, you know, give you some background on that and then a little bit on the industry and the perspective of the, today's webcast, is Medical Tourism Association is the global trade, trade association for medical and wellness travel. 
So it's got over 15 regional offices around the world, 300 members in over 100 different countries. Some of those members are our healthcare clusters, like chambers of commerce or government. Um, and the MTA focuses on educating uh, both healthcare consumers and travelers, um, so uh, B2C and then also B2B, um, you know, hospitals, hotels, governments, insurance companies on medical tourism. So it's uh, healthcare consumer education is done through medicaltourism.com, um, you know, which is one of the top websites where healthcare consumers and patients get information on medical tourism. And then we've got uh, the Medical Tourism Magazine, which is read by about 120,000 people around the world. Um, in over 90 different countries, and then there's a social network, Medical Tourism City, and the MTA does a lot of education through webcasts. Um, it does uh, workshops all around the world, conferences around the world, training around the world, and, you know, works with all the industry professionals. So, you know, MTA is really excited to be able to partner with OHA to really bring education on what's going on in wellness travel and medical travel. Because I think mean, these are going to be two of the biggest and hottest trends in the hospitality space going forward. Um, you know, what are growing areas in tourism where, you know, you have a large segment of people traveling? Um, and where that segment is growing, uh, you know, significantly and governments are investing in that and tourism boards. And that's wellness and medical travel. It's a hot new thing. Um, and what's interesting is when someone travels for medical travel or wellness travel, you know, there's research been done that there's a trend that they're staying much longer than the normal tourists. Um, they are, uh, you know, staying from anywhere from one and a half to two weeks, and they're bringing a companion with them. So they're, they're, they're spending more time in the country, and they're actually spending five to ten times the amount that a normal tourist does. So it has a really big financial impact for the local economy. So wellness and medical travel isn't a new phenomenon. Individuals have traveled abroad for, for benefits since the ancient times. So you know, during the latter half of the 20th century, wealthy people traveled from less developed areas of the world um, to developed nations to access better medical expertise, or it could be wellness. You know, people traveling from um, one part of the world to um, you know, go to hot springs or spas or to go see a doctor. So wellness tourism and medical tourism have been around for thousands of years. But now, you know, what we're seeing is the industry really becoming defined, it being, um, you know, standardized, and this being, you know, a big part of what um, hotels are involved in dealing with, what travel agents are, uh, are marketing and offering to healthcare consumers and wellness travels, and also what consumers are looking for. They're looking for different experiences. Um, so why are people choosing to travel more for wellness, for example? Um, healthy living, um, rejuvenation and relaxation, meaning and connection, authentic experiences, disease for prevention and, and management, some of it's spiritual, some of it's occupational, environmental, intellectual, emotional, physical, or social. Um, so more people are traveling for both medical tourism and wellness because Travel is more affordable. You know, airline tickets, um, it's very easy to compare. There's a lot more competition. Uh, there's the growth of healthcare and wellness clusters, which are marketing, um, you know, cities or destinations for medical or wellness tourism. And there's easy access to information on the web. And people are more open now than ever to wellness or medical care. Um, you know, the world's globalized, and people have access to information on the web instantly. And people are more aware of the importance of taking care of their health or their well-being, and they're willing to travel anywhere in the world for it. So, um, you know, what wellness services are individuals seeking, it really varies. You know, we really can't cover them all, but health and healing, food and nutrition, fitness and movement, mind and spirit and body, it could be stress reduction, finding yourself, um, anything, Ayurveda, um, you know, any type of thing that's alternative and different. It could be coming just for the spa, and the, you know, which is part of the relaxation part. Um, so here's, you know, some other examples. I already mentioned Ayurveda, uh, yoga and meditation, healing experiences, spiritual, purist fitness. There's people going for detox, people going for nutrition to really learn how to eat healthier. Now, if we look at the medical tourism side, 
what are patients traveling for in medical tourism? And millions of patients cross borders every year to travel for medical care. Um, they're coming for orthopedics, hips, knees, back, spine, cancer treatment, heart procedures, transplants, dental treatment, uh, bariatric care, alternative care, stem cell treatment, uh, cosmetic surgery, infertility, rehabilitation, and, and geriatric care. We're going to see a lot of people in the future um, traveling and retiring overseas and needing long-term care facilities. So on the medical side, there's a lot of growth for it. In the past, it was really known for also, you know, really cosmetic and dental treatment five, six, seven years ago. But now we're seeing that really change and people are willing to travel for core procedures, um, meaning people are traveling for, uh, you know, orthopedics and transplants in very big ways. If we look at famous people who travel for medical tourism, you have Steve Jobs of Apple, you know, Farrah Fawcett. Um, if any of you watch football, Peyton Manning um, from Colts. So if you look at Steve Jobs as an example, he traveled for cancer care that wasn't available in the U.S. and he went to Europe. He could have built the most amazing hospital here in the U.S. Um, right in his backyard. He could have brought in the top tech, um, technology, the top doctors, everything. He had access to it all to build it his own, but he traveled overseas because he, he wanted to get a treatment that wasn't available at home. Dental tourism is a huge area of growth going forward in the future. Dental implants are really expensive. Um, you know, I, I know if you're in a developed country, it's a less developed. Um, you know, people are traveling. People go um, uh, are traveling from uh, you know Western Europe to Eastern Europe because the dental care is less. Um, you know, you might have to spend a couple days, a week or two. So you can really combine it with a vacation. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people from the U.S. travel outside the U.S. for dental care, and, and the cost is quite substantial. You can save about 90% on implants. Uh, I was just told yesterday of a story of somebody in the Caribbean island of Antigua being quoted $8,000 for two dental implants, um, and they just got a quote to go to Costa Rica for it, and they're going to save, I think it was like 70, 80% of what they were quoted in Antigua in the Caribbean. Um, so uh, as we have baby boomers. You know, people who are getting a lot older in a lot of different countries all over the world, U.S., Japan, everywhere. Everyone's uh, facing what they call the silver tsunami. Um, and these people are going to need dental care and dental implants, and they're going to travel for it um, and combine it with vacations. So there's a huge opportunity in the dental vacations. Now, if we look at um, wellness and medical travel by region, and this is uh, the source is the Global Wellness Tourism Economy Report, um, which you can get online, and you look at some of these different uh, areas, they reported the top five countries for wellness and medical travel were um, the U.S., Germany, Japan, France, and Austria. Now, when you look at these numbers, you have to realize it's a very niche industry, so this all varies. You know, like I said, you'll have people where it might say Germany. That could just be just for the medical tourism, because Germany and Europe is a big medical tourism destination, um, and, and so is uh, Switzerland. But if people are going for dental care, obviously it's going to be countries like Hungary, you know, or Poland, or countries in the Eastern Bloc, um, you, know, you know, that people are traveling for that, because the dental care is, is uh, high quality but more affordable. Um, so it really depends on what procedure or, or what type of it is, like wellness, because I know there's also very heavily on the wellness and the spa side in Eastern Europe. Um, and this shows you some stats. You know, it shows about, you know, I think it was 181 billion expenditures in the U.S. with 16.3 million trips, you know, 32 million trips in Latin America, 203 million over in Europe and the Asia Pacific, 120 million. Um, you know, in, in other areas, about 2 million in, in um, I would say, Central to South Africa and about 5 million in Northern Africa. Um, the one thing you have to realize is it's medical tourism is wellness. It's here to stay, and it's definitely taking off, meaning you look at the numbers today versus the last couple of years, totally different game. Um, so many more people travel, and they travel because they're very aware of this industry. When I look back to when the Medical Tourism Association was founded, um, you know, back in 2000, before that, it was founded in 2007. In 2004, I, um, I was involved in working, you know, with the International Health Tribune, which is uh, with the international version of the New York Times, on their first article on medical tourism. It was one of the first articles in the world on medical tourism. And from, you know, I've worked with thousands of media publications on stories on medical and wellness tourism since that time. 
But we started out with just a couple stories back in 2004. We even, you know, did, I did something with Time Magazine um, and some others. But now versus today, you're seeing articles come out every single day. So there are thousands of articles around the world that are published on wellness and medical tourism. And this has changed consumer awareness, buyer awareness, travel agent awareness. Um, so everyone is so aware of this industry, and, and, and that's the neat part about it. Um, and, and, and as we see the trend of more people traveling overseas, it's all about how do you, how do you position yourself to seize upon that opportunity. Um, so wellness from uh, the SRI International uh, you know, Wellness Study um, you know, found that wellness tourism is about a $438.6 billion industry. Um, and it's a growing niche of the $3.2 trillion global tourism economy. Um, and you've got inbound and outbound. And then you also have domestic tourism, both for medical travel and wellness, meaning that people traveling within their own country or within their own state or their own county for here. So, um, you know, it's outbound, it's inbound, it's domestic. And the neat part about it is it's happening everywhere, meaning, you know, you'll have people come to Germany for care, you'll have Germans leave Germany for care, you'll have Germans traveling within Germany. And this trend literally happens everywhere in the world. You'll have people from Kenya leaving Kenya to potentially go to India or other countries for medical care, and then you'll have people from other countries like Tanzania coming into Kenya for care. In the U.S., you'll have U.S. patients leaving the U.S. for health and wellness travel, for medical tourism procedures, and then you'll have people from all over the world coming to the U.S. also for medical tourism and wellness. So it's a tremendous amount of cross-border care. Um, you know, if you're looking down and breaking down the cost of it, it says for the lodging, for hotels and motels, it's about a $93.4 billion industry for food and beverage, about a $71.9 billion industry for shopping, a $64.8 billion industry for activities and excursions, a $61.4 billion industry. So it touches upon all these different uh, aspects that really affect the local economy. And if you're on this call and you work with tourism boards, you should get those tourism boards involved in supporting this industry. A lot of tourism boards um, or uh, city uh, visitors and conventions bureau, a lot of them are supporting it. And for those that aren't, you can, you know, we can help you provide the case studies to them to show why they should start supporting this in your local area and supporting your organization in its efforts, meaning you really have to get the government behind it. Um, so this is the breakdown a little bit um, from the Global Wellness Tourism Economy Report of global tourism industry from culinary tourism to wellness, to ecotourism, to sports tourism, to cultural, but this is where it shows the $3.2 trillion industry, you know, it's estimating wellness and medical tourism combined is close to a $500 billion industry. Um, and it's estimated that, you know, SRI estimated the wellness tourist spends about 130% more than the average tourist. So who are the key players in wellness and medical travel? You've got the hospitality and tourism side, hotels, resorts, tourism attractions, restaurants, retail, the health side, hospitals, alternative medicine providers, integrative health centers, insurance companies and employers, spas, you know, hot mineral springs, gyms, fitness centers, salons, retreats. On the government side, you've got ministries of tourism, economic development, ministries of health. Um, so what are the roles of hospitality and travel? sectors in this industry, you know, so, you know, if you're a hotel, you really have to look at who, you know, what, what, what am I going after? Am I going after the wellness sector? Am I going after the medical tourism sector? Is my staff trained for it? Um, how do I go out and train my staff? How do I market my facility? You know, is that me going out to directly to the consumer? Is it me partnering with travel agents? Is it me, um, uh, you know, going and partnering with the local hospitals. How do you develop your strategy? Are you going to convert rooms in your hotel for uh, medical tourists? Meaning you could be determining what type of medical tourists do we want. Do we want ones that are minor, um, you know, and really don't need a lot of guidance or help, or do you need ones that are going to need handicap access? So um, you've got to really develop your, your, your model and strategically plan for it so you can realize what you want to do. Obviously, dealing with a dental tourist is different than dealing with a cosmetic uh, surgery tourist because they might have bandages that are bleeding. Um, you know, and, and, and how, do you, how do you accommodate that? 
versus someone coming for a hip replacement where they're going to need a wheelchair and access to, you know, a, you know, a handicapped uh, bathroom. Um, and then you have the wellness tourist. So if you're, you know, uh, dealing with the wellness tourist, you know, how are you going to train your staff and, and provide that wellness experience and understand what they're looking for? Because different cultures of different people, you know, their definition of what wellness uh, is is going to be slightly different than the others, and how do you customize everything, you know, to those to the to that guest experience? But I know, you know, that's the whole movement within the luxury hospitality space is moving everything towards the guest experience. Um, this is a chart from our uh, the 2013 MTA's Medical Tourism Survey Report in partnership with George Washington, um, and this was looking at the number of nights medical travelers stay. So you look at 31 percent spent about three weeks or more, 31% spent all out 11 to 20 nights, um, you know, and then you look at, you know, no nights, about 8%, in and out, two nights, 15%, um, three nights, 8%. Um, so it really varies across the board, but a majority are spending a long period of time, and they're traveling with a companion. So the hospitality integration. Um, what's interesting, too, is we're also seeing hospitals which are also building hotels, or you know, some are partnering with hotels, some are building hotels within their hospital or within their wellness retreat, um, such as you know Barbados Facility Center in Barbados. There's a lot of things even with the cruise industries, like Renaissance Cruises, who are doing treatment and recovery on cruise ships. And there's actually someone building a cruise ship now just for wellness and medical tra uh, travel. Um, there's lifestyle treatments at the you know, resort, relaxation, education, corrective behavior, cleansing, holistic approaches. Services already found have many spa operations, but people are now traveling in greater numbers for them. And one of the things you have to realize is, you know, you can't just pop on your website, we provide these spa treatments, and you know, and expect them to come. How do you differentiate your hospitality business from other, any other hospitality business that are out there marketing this? Um, so role for hospitality, staff training for medical for a medical concierge program, cultural and logistically competent staff, um, you know, dealing with issues such as housekeeping by appointment, um, you know, because they, you know, these will be different than your normal guests. So you need to offer 24-hour room service if you're not doing it right now, um, shopping and delivery services, special dietary provisions, transportation um, to and from the, uh, the hospital or the clinic. Um, having a service coordinator, one contact in the hotel that could deal with medical tourists or wellness tourists, maybe getting someone certified um, who can train, who can be, you know, certified and educated in this, but also someone who can train your staff as, like, through a train the trainer program. Um, all inclusive pricing and coordinating with the hospital for follow up care. Um, you know, and, and a lot of times the hospital, the clinic, um, you know, will handle all this, but you've got to create this whole partnership. Um, with uh, the hospital or clinic um, or the wellness retreat so that everything is really uh, streamlined. Um, and obviously it's important, I think, to get certified as a hotel um, or as a hospitality professional in wellness um, uh, tourism or medical tourism, meaning you know, there's certification and training programs not just for the individual, um, but also for the hotel where well, the hotel can get certified as a wellness hotel or, or as a medical tourism hotel. So you're going to learn best practices by going through that certification and training. You're going to attract more consumers, which is going to increase profitability for your um, business, differentiate yourself from other hotels, and enhance your international brand. Um, so the role of uh, you know, the travel agent. Um, for travel agents, it's a great way to find a new niche, a new opportunity to have a new conversations with your clientele. And it will definitely lead to new revenue and income sources. So, you know, realizing wellness-focused consumers, you know, are moderate to active spa goers. Um, they're open to new ways to approach health and exercise and traveling for it, and definitely motivated by effects of aging and how to prevent it, preventative care. Um, and then you've also got the sickness reactor consumer, people with a health condition seeking a newer alternative approach to treatment for their condition, such as people who travel from all over the world to the Dead Sea in Jordan or Israel to get treatment in the Dead Sea for things like psoriasis, skin conditions. And the Dead Sea has amazing results for it. I mean, when I talk to people, most people don't even realize there are European health insurance companies that actually 
will cover under the insurance policy the airfare and the hotel and all the travel expenses for those European insurers to go to Jordan or Israel and stay at some of these amazing resorts right on the Dead Sea to go in and get treatments every day for psoriasis because the cost of treating the psoriasis is much less than treating it with conventional prescription medication. And so that is a huge opportunity, and I've never heard of the spas actively pursuing the insurance companies to send them more patients. But this is where things are changing, where you're getting even insurance companies or employers starting to cover some of these things. Um, so obviously some of the concerns for travel agents, and this, could be, this also goes for hotels, is safety, quality, liability. You know, how, how do I prevent liability of, of complications happen if someone's coming for medical care? And these can all be addressed. Um, it, it's making sure that if you're partnered with a hospital or a doctor, it's the right one. It's one that provides extremely high quality care does it right, has the right credentials, where they're going to minimize complications or issues. But with medical care, you have to realize that complications happen. doesn't matter how good the hospital is, things go wrong. And for that, you need proper waivers and proper insurance. And, and so these things can be addressed. They're being addressed now by hospitals, by hospitals, by people involved in the sector, and they're doing it successfully. So it's building the right program, the right foundation to address these issues. Um, and then for travel agents, you know, they, they have an option. They, um, you know, they can work directly with the hospital, and sometimes the hospital will work with the hotel and build packages that include everything. Um, they can work with facilitators who help coordinate and send patients overseas. They can become a facilitator themselves. And travel agents, too, can build packages with the hotel. Um, comprehensive package for everything, the wellness, or medical travel, you know, everything together. We're seeing another really big trend, which is, which is kind of really neat to see, is corporate wellness. This market's exploding. Employers and insurers focusing on getting their employees or their insured healthy, um, focused on eating healthy, living healthy, preventing conditions, and becoming educated. So we're starting to see travel agents and also hotels, spas, retreats getting very active in corporate wellness. You know, you see ones, um, uh, like, you know, Canyon Ranch, uh, you know, uh, Miraval, and others who are active in wellness retreats. And they're, they're getting C-suite people who are coming in from companies who are detoxing, going for meetings, and, and, and at the same time trying to get healthy, doing executive health, health checkups, or just relaxing. And some employers are incentivizing their employees and saying, listen, if you act, uh, if you engage in healthy behavior, we're going to give you an incentive. We'll give you gift cards. And those gift cards could be, um, you know, or it could be gift cards or cash, but if it's gift cards, you know, it makes sense to give them gift cards for spa, for treatment, for hotels, for travel, things that allow them to relax, de-stress, that will allow them to come back and be more productive employees. Um, so this is a very growing trend, and in the health insurance, and the employer marketplace is one of the fastest growing trends in the insurance marketplace. Healthcare costs are going up around the world. Um, I think it's something like 80% of um, uh, the expenses within health insurance plans are all preventable. So employers and insurers around the world are all investing in corporate wellness. So it's really neat to start seeing the travel and the hospitality sector get actively engaged in, in being the incentive and even going to employers or insurers and say, use us as the incentive. Send, send, send your employees here as a reward. Um, when we look at people traveling overseas, what's really interesting, when we look at, for example, medical tourists, um, you know, uh, there's not been a lot of studies about global medical tourism. Um, but one study uh, of patients here in the United States traveling overseas, they found about a third of them said that they would be willing to travel to another country for their, like, comprehensive medical care, like orthopedic knees, hearts, transplants, if the quality was equal to or better than in the United States and the cost was more affordable. But when we looked at ethnic groups, like Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, it was highest about, went from one-third to about 50, up to 56.8% of Asian Americans, or 50. 4.1% of Hispanic Americans said they would do it. And that's because there's no cultural language barriers. So the biggest market 
for ethnic, um, uh, you know, for wellness and medical tourism is going to be ethnic people willing to travel. People who want to travel to that country, whether um, they speak the language, they understand the culture, they're from that country, or they're, you know, you know, could be their grandparents were from that country, or their, you know, their parents, where they're much more open to traveling to that country, and they have less concerns about quality, liability, or other issues. So this is a really niche market that shouldn't be ignored. But I think either way, what's really neat to see is the statistics are very high. When you say one-third of people are opening to travel to cancer or orthopedic care to another country, that's a large number. That's larger than most people would expect. But when you say over, you know, 56.8% of Asian and Americans would do it, that's really high. Now, when you, that's medical tourism. When you look at wellness tourism, you know those numbers are going to be much higher because you want to be in a, in a beautiful destination, a relaxing destination. You're not concerned with the quality of care of the physicians of the hospitals because you might be going for spa treatment. You might be going for nutrition. Um, so those numbers are going to be a lot higher. Um, so, um, you know, there are two uh, programs, um, you know, for, uh, you know, hotels, hospitality, travel agents, and also individuals. There's individual certification, um, the, uh, you know, the MTA's International Hospitality Medical uh, Tourism Certification that you can do online um, at your own pace at any time and sign up or do it at, at the, uh, the annual conference. Um, and then there's one specifically in wellness tourism. And then um, there's a certification for the actual hotels in either separately wellness or medical tourism or a combined certification can happen where, you know, a team can go out, assess your hospital, do training, and work towards getting your facility uh, certified so you can really kind of go after um, this market. And, um, there, you know, with the partnership with the International Luxury Hotel Association, if you contact us, um, there's going to be some special packages for ILHA uh, members and some discounts. Um, and so part of the certification really goes into best practices. It goes into the operational side, the financial side, the uh, psychosocial aspects of the entire guest experience, from how do you, how do you deal with the guests um, while they're there, um, to how did you train your staff, to how do you even market and, and, and target the guests. Um, and it's unique for each individual hotel. Um, and, you know, and so it varies because hotel in, um, in Thailand is going to be totally different than a hotel in Greece um, in that, you know, the type of guests they'll be trying to attract is going to be based upon the, the country of the guests you're trying to attract, the culture and the programs, whether it's wellness or medical travel that you're going to offer. And it's all focused on sustainable development and ROI and training someone within your hotel um, so that, you know, they can train the rest of your staff to have a sustainable program. And it covers things like physical environment, international guest management, communication and education, uh, financial transactions, uh, marketing, risk management, um, cultural competence, um, uh, travel and tourism, guest safety, uh, guest transitions, guest companion uh, expectations, um, and all those things. So. Um, at, so, uh, and also guest advocacy, and the, obviously I think one of the most ex uh, important things besides guest expectation is the guest experience. Um, it covers also wellness dimension, um, you know, uh, the uh, physical environment, international guest management, uh, communication and education, financial transactions, risk management guest advocacy, cultural competence, travel and tourism, uh, guest safety. So what's the importance of improving the, uh, the patient experience or the travel experience? Um, there's the healthcare cycle and there's the hospitality guest cycle. So there's, um, you know, pre-admission, um, you know, we could, we could cover, I could almost take, you know, 40 hours and try to, you know, cover everything that's involved with the medical tourism and the wellness tourists. But we're going to really try to, you know, do a high-level thing to really get, get you an understanding. And so um, if it's healthcare related, you know, that before they get admitted, there's admission, there's treatment, there's discharge, and there's follow-up. And depending on your level of involvement as a hotel, some of this may apply and some uh, won't, but you at least want to be aware of it all. Um, then the hospitality guest cycle is different than the hospital because the hospital, going back to it, it's someone coming to the hospital, dealing with pre-admission, getting admitted to the hospital, getting their treatment, getting discharged, getting aftercare. With the hospitality guest cycle, 
it's that patient, you know, coming, you know, planning the, the pre-arrival, them arriving, how you're going to treat them as a wellness tourist or a medical tourist, dealing with the occupancy, the departure, and the follow-up also. Um, so the cycle is, you know, you're talking about they're going to, you know, choosing their service, is it wellness related, is it medical travel related, choosing their destination before they get to the, to the hotel, when they arrive, um, you know, checking into the hotel, them getting admitted, um, you know, to the hospital, getting their treatment, getting discharged, um, then moving back to the hospitality, the hotel, getting their aftercare, which may happen within the hotel, or they may be brought outside the hotel for the rehab and the aftercare, departure from um, the hospitality side, and then follow up from the hospitality side. And uh, wellness is, uh, is very, very similar, um, so I won't really go into those slides, almost identical to the medical tourist cycle. So I think it's really important to understand the special needs of the medical travel or the wellness travel um, and, you know, the, the consumer experience and the perception that patients um, have of their interactions um, directly or indirectly with your hospital is their experience, meaning if they don't have a good experience, um, I'm sorry, a good perception or a good experience, they're going to relate that into poor quality. So if they're coming for medical tourism, an orthopedic procedure, or cosmetic or dental, if they had a bad quality outcome, that is also going to affect their view of the hospitality side, the hotel side. And all the areas that touch upon the patient experience are the international office dealing with them, the hospital, billing, nursing, the hotel staff, marketing. You know, we've heard of things of someone getting an amazing um, surgeon coming for an orthopedic procedure, and then they um, basically have a treated poorly by the hotel or, or, or something very, very minor and stupid. They're charged something, an incidental for the hotel, whether it's internet or something else they didn't know about, and now they're no longer talking positive about their whole experience. So it's really you need to break down, and we won't be able to go into it into this webcast because of time constraints, but what are all the expectations of the wellness tourist and the medical tourist and how to, how to deal with them so that you have a consistent positive experience. I mean, you're already doing it on the hospitality side with your guests. Now it's just taking that, those standards and those procedures and that checklist and moving it over to wellness or medical tourism. So we all know great patient experiences for medical wellness tours don't just happen out of the blue. Um, just like, you know, when you go into a luxury hotel and you really get that amazing guest experience, you love it. It's personalized and you rave about it to everyone out there. The same thing happens when you're dealing with a wellness or a medical tourist. So you can't just say, oh, we're, we, do, we do a great job with guest experience, so send us the, the medical tourists or the wellness tourists because we, we've got that. We, we know what they want, and we know how to treat people right as a guest. So it, it's, you, know, you can't do that. You have to get the right training. You have to understand their expectations and how to service them. And this is all a result of planning, training, and putting a structure in place that's going to allow it to thrive and have a consistent positive um, outcome. So obviously it has an has, has a outcome on your bottom line. And, um, uh, you, know, the, you know, if you have a great patient experience, you're going to have a lot of word of mouth. So I know on the hospitality side, it's really clear that, um, you know, word of mouth is everything. You know, when I travel anywhere, I go to TripAdvisor. I go to other websites, and I look at how did people rate this, and then what are some of the last reviews to see if this is the right fit? Um, and that's how I book my trip. And a lot of times, that's how I'll even choose restaurants. It could be a Yelp or TripAdvisor for the city that I'm going to, no matter where it is in the world. And the same, you know, so and I know this is something that, you know, hoteliers are dealing with, is really how do you manage this? How do you create positive expectations? How do you respond to people um, through social media? because it can drive a lot of people to your hotel. So the same thing happens with wellness and medical tourism. You give the VIP treatment, they have a great experience, they share it with everyone else, and word of mouth will bring more wellness tourists and more uh, medical tourists. Um, you know, Echo Research in 2012 did a study that said three out of four consumers say they have spent more with an organization because of a history of positive customer service experiences. And I know that, you know, for hoteliers, it's common sense. Um, and it was prepared for American Express, this study. And the common sense is the hotels know if you have a great experience, that person will come back. They won't try another hotel when they come back to that city. So also, 
if we look, you know, the survey showed that on average consumers tell 15 people about their good experiences. And nearly half of consumers tell someone about their good customer service experience all the time. But poor service leads to lost sales, and that the opposite is true. And they found that consumers tell 24 people about their bad experiences. And 56% of consumers talk to people about their bad experiences all the time. So poor, poor service leads to lost sales. And this is a little chart about showing the difference between people, you know, bad experiences and how many people will share that with others. Um, and it could have a really big impact. I know personally, you know, using, you know, social media and these sites uh, and other people's reviews, there are hotels that looked great. They had great, you know, star ratings. And, um, you know, the price was right for a trip that I was going on. And I see one or two negative reviews. And, you know, that decides that, you know what, I'm not going to take the chance. I'm not going to stay at that hotel. I'm going to go to another hotel. So, you know, if we look at those statistics for wellness or medical travels, that means if you have one wellness or medical travel patient a month that's having a bad, better for experience, then that means 288 people a year are hearing your neg negative things about your hospital. So it's an exponential factor that multiplies. So if you're losing, let's say you're a hospital or clinic, um, and, 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 you know, we, we could do the same analysis for hotels. Um, but on a very low end, a hospital clinic is charging um, patients $7,000 a year to come for a medical procedure. Or it can be, you know, in Miami, you've got Pritikin Spa, so it's a hotel and wellness retreat. And, and I could be wrong with the price, but let's assume they're charging $13,000 for someone to come a week or two to their hotel and a wellness retreat. Um, if they're losing three of those wellness tourists per month due to bad experiences at not $13,000 but $7,000, that means they lost a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000 for the year through those experiences. So imagine it's not three, three wellness tourists per month, um, but maybe it's uh, 15 wellness tourists per month. These are not a big numbers. These are very small numbers. But now you're talking about almost $1.2 million that well, that wellness retreat and hotel is losing from just the bad experience. Um, and a lot of people aren't even, a lot of hotels aren't even tracking it. They're not even, if they have something in place now, they're not assessing what the, what the experience is and how to really improve it and how to target on a global scale the consumers to really come. Um, so this is an example over um, five years, how those three well, uh, wellness tours per month is relating to a quarter of a million dollars per year. So over five years, that's $1.26 million. So what if you're a hotel doing a lot of business, and it's not three, three traveling consumers per month, you're losing 100 consumers per month. Um, that's 33 times this number. Um, so I don't have my calculator with me, but over five years, I'll do the simple math. That's almost $33 million over five years. So if we divide by uh, you know, five, you're talking about almost $6 million a year in lost uh, revenue um, you know, with 100 wellness tourists per month not coming. But that also shows on the flip side, which we don't go into, which we really should, um, is what if you, were, you, know, you weren't doing the wellness or the medical travel and you, 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 know, you turned your operation into doing it? Um, going back to those slides, this means that you know, you could be increasing your revenue, you know, by, uh, you know, millions of dollars per year or hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to your hospitality business by implementing this and having positive experiences. And that customer service experience and creating the best guest experience, you know, deals with the, from the moment they, they land at the airport to being picked up to their, to their, how they get their meals and how their complaints are dealt and the billing and the whole customer service experience. A lot of people are traveling for medical or wellness tourism because of the experience. They're getting, they're telling people how they're being treated by like, like it's royalty, like kings or queens, and that the people who are trained in their experience, who are, who are, you know, um, you know, almost like you, let's say you have a wellness concierge, someone who's responsible for them, they're going above and beyond, and it's creating tremendous royalty, uh, loyalty. And when those people come back. They're telling everyone they know, listen, I went to this place for medical tourism or I went to this place for wellness, and I, um, I recommend 
you go to it. It was a great experience. And, and, and one thing I haven't even covered in here, when we look at medical tourism, there's a huge trend of insurance companies that are implementing medical tourism. So global insurance companies that are now telling people that we will cover you for medical care anywhere in the world. You choose. So there's one huge insurer, um, you know, it's got like 14 million covered lives. It's global. Where they have a policy where it'll cover airfare, travel, hotel, everything for people to go where they want to. And more, every day, more insurers are doing this. You know, we just got contacted by, about two weeks ago, a really large U.S. insurance company. Others have already done it here in the U.S., but another one that's going to be implementing outbound, so Americans leaving the U.S. The one I was talking about before, the international, they have covered life all over the world. So this is a really global trend that's going to be covered. And, you know, there's two things. You can either be at the front of the trend and be involved in it and get the business, or you can kind of let the trend um, pass you by. So obviously there's two markets, direct B2C, the consumer market, the, you know, the traveling wellness tourists or medical tourists, and then there's the corporate market, dealing with insurance companies, employers, and or travel agents. Um, and they're different markets, so the corporate market is relationship driven, it's a smaller target, longer sales process, um, you know, buying decisions are slightly different, there's multiple decision makers and you usually need to have that face time um, and build a relationship because it's a global business. Whereas the consumer is service driven, it's a larger target market, but a shorter sales process, buying decisions often by price or desire, and there's usually one decision maker or two, the spouse. A lot of times um, that will be, you know, the, you know, it could be the, uh, you know, if it's a married couple, it could be the wife who's, who's the decision maker and has a lot of influence, and the communication is by email and phone. It's not face to face. Um, so some of the issues in medical travel to think about with best practices, you know, video conferencing between the patients and uh, the surgeon or the wellness retreat, uh, dealing with visas and passports, flights and lodging, uh, collecting payments in country cell phones. Um, you know, tours and sightseeing, uh, providing a main point of contact while the patient's at the hospital or the wellness retreat and following up with patients. Um, and people do, even if they're going for medical care, they're going and engaging in tourism. We did a documentary, the Medical Tourism Association, it's on our website, of a, of a gentleman, Bob, who went from Orlando, Florida to Costa Rica for a double knee replacement. Um, it would have cost him $100,000 here in the U.S. He couldn't afford it. He had made a decision, I'm actually going to become a cripple and go into a wheelchair and not walk. Found out about medical tourism, decided to go to Costa Rica, got a double knee replacement for $20,000, saved $80,000 U.S. dollars. And when he was coming, he was super excited. He spent a couple weeks in the hotel, but he was super excited about, you know, doing some kind of a tourism activity. He did a tram, one of those tram things above the rainforest where you're in that, like, cart with the, uh, the cable line that takes you above the rainforest. So there are things that they can do that is tourist and it's based upon what the doctor recommends and what the patient is actually able to do. So what are revenue models? So there's definitely different revenue models. So there's a referral fee. So hotels or travel agents can get, get involved, partner with facilitators or become facilitators, and get a percentage uh, commission of the fee, a set fee that they charge. Or for hotels, it could just be, um, more, more um, uh, guests at your hotel. And then also if they're doing tours and things like that, there's, there's packages that you can set up. But for hotels, obviously, it's about filling occupancy um, and a new, new line of revenue. Because I know with, with hospitals, medical tourists end up spending more typically than local patients. So hospitals and clinics and doctors view medical tourists as providing higher profitability than their normal patients. So you need to set and develop a strategy. You've got to set realistic goals and expectations. You've got to develop action plans and timelines to reach um, goal, you know, the goals of and, and, and nailing the wellness tourist or medical tourist experience, and you've got to measure your results. Um, you've got to have information on your website. Um, you've got to train your staff within the hospitality sector, and you've got to say, hey, you know, do I just need to train staff? Do I need to hire staff? Um, you know, what are my goals? What are my financial goals? And how do I measure the success of my program? Um, and it's not going to happen at the blink of the eye. It's something that you need to invest in, but it's something that sets you apart. It could be the reason people travel to your hotel. You know, I get excited if I'm going to a hotel and it's wellness related because I know it's going to be a really neat experience. 
Um, so you got to identify your target market, um, hone in on, you know, if you're going to attract wellness or medical tourists, where am I going to attract them from? You don't need to say I'm going to attract them from all over the world. You could say I'm going to start with there's a market that, um, you know, like Chinese. I have, everyone's going after the Chinese tourists, so you get determined I want to focus on the Chinese tourists. Or you might be getting a lot of um, tourists from China or Spain or wherever, and you figure out, you know, so, so create a niche, niche um, target market and focus on that market and really, really do it well and then expand it to other markets, but identify what the consumer from that market is looking for. Is it the wellness? Is it the medical tourism? And then within each of those segments, within wellness and medical tourism, what are they, they going to travel for? Um, and then partner. If you're, if you're in the hospitality sector, you can partner with, uh, you know, you've got the hospital, the doctor, the tour operator in the hotel and creating that tight partnership and then going out and marketing it. And at the end of the day, it's about the positive guest experience and um, focusing on word of mouth and over delivering and exceeding everybody's expectations. Um, so I was saying before, um, there are different certifications uh, that you can get. Um, there's one, you know, just for medical tourism, certified medical tourism professional that you can get online. Um, there's one specifically for individuals for wellness, and then there's one uh, also um, we have uh, facilities, so the hotels that can get certified in actually becoming a certified medical tourism hotel or a certified wellness, um, wellness hotel. Um, as I said, the um, International Luxury Hotel Association's annual event will be co-located with the Medical Tourism Conference, which will be September 20th to the 24th in Washington, D.C. We invite you all to come. Um, to really learn about trends in the luxury space, and then also trends in what's really going on in medical and wellness tourism, and there'll be more information um, on the events, um, you know, uh, in the next couple of weeks on the Luxury Hotel Association's website. Um, the entire event across all tracks and events um, is going to be about 3,000 attendees from over 100 different uh, countries. So some of the websites uh, you'll need to check out if you haven't. Um, and, and by the way, feel free to ask any questions, to type it in the box. Um, I'd be happy to answer it during this webcast or respond to the messaging, um, or you feel free to email uh, myself or Barack afterwards, um, you know, for either of us to email or talk. Um, but you've got luxuryhotelassociation.org is the International Luxury Hotel Association's website. Medicaltourismassociation.com is the MTA's uh, website. LuxuryHoteliers.com is the Luxury Hotel Association magazine um, uh, website, and uh, the Medical Tourism Conference, um, tied in with the Wellness Conference, is Medical Tourism Congress, C-O-N-G-R-E-S-S dot com. I encourage you all to uh, feel free to follow up with us on the wellness or uh, medical travel. Any questions that you have. Um, any guidance or direction you need. And I also encourage you to join um, the International Luxury Hotel Association. They're going to be doing a lot with professional development. Uh, the resource center is being rolled out where, uh, you know, individual professional and corporate members will have access to different tools. And if anyone's interested in joining the Medical Tourism Association, uh, you know, people need to feel free to email me. My email is john, J-O-N, at medicaltourismassociation.com, all spelled out. And Barack Hershowitz, the president of the International Luxury Hotel Association, his email address is info at luxuryhotelassociation.org. So I know we're right out of time. We're almost um, at the end of the hour. So I really appreciate everyone coming on the call. And have um, you know really a great week. And stay tuned for uh, more additional educational webcasts on not just wellness and medical travel within luxury hotel, but other trending topics within the luxury space from Hilha. Everyone take care. Thank you.